Um, we surprisingly have a packed agenda today. Um, so we're going to get started. Whoops, go back. Um, so I'm excited for a panel discussion on local bike infrastructure uh, projects. As I think everybody here probably knows from my emails, this is Bike Month, and today is Bike Everywhere Day. So we are focusing in today on what our local communities are doing to help improve bike infrastructure for um, making sure all people are able to ride safely. Of course, we work on other issues in other months, uh, just highlighting this particular one this month. Um, it'll take about 50 minutes. We will then have a few updates, and I've listed a few of them to make sure that we hit them, including uh, a briefing by Gene Kemp, who just joined us uh, from PSRC on the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we, we just got notified over the last two days of our consolidated grants that were awarded. Um, and so Mariana has not joined us yet, but she will be, and we'll be able to provide an update on that information. Um, I'm excited about our Stanwood Camino Name the Van uh, contest that we have going. And finally, uh, we have the Darrington Mobility Study update, and we can share, if we have time, uh, some of the early survey results. And finally, our roundtable that we do each time uh, of our bi-monthly meetings. So with that, I am excited to uh, introduce our panel. Uh, Sherman just joined us uh, on the call, so he didn't make it in the round of introductions. Um, but he will be here for the city of Bothell. Um, we have Ryan Haig and Bertrand House of the city of Edmonds, um, Amy Hansen and Carl Ongren from the city of Linwood, Scott Peterson from the city of Monroe, uh, each with a short presentation of, of the bike projects that they are doing. Um, and then Jennifer Pipelik of the Vernon Health Commission will be able to join us for Q&A. Uh, Vernon has been fantastic in funding uh, bike projects, uh, both physical infrastructure and some of the, the programming um, within their service area, which includes Linwood and Edmonds, uh, two of the, the cities here on our partners call. So with that, I'm going to immediately jump uh, into the panel discussion. And Sherman wasn't able to join us uh, quite before the meeting started. So I don't know if he's quite yet queued up to go with the PowerPoint. Um, yeah. but if you are Sherman, uh, we, we can save you for last if you're not ready um, or just join you into Q&A. Um, and then we, we instead will go through alphabetical order from Edmonds, Linwood, and Monroe. So I'll, uh, and unfortunately our power just went out here at City oh, Hall. No. Okay. So I can't even get to my network and get to my, my slideshow. I wish I had sent emailed it to you but now i can't even get to it to email to you to run it for me um so i'll 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 wait to the end and see if our power comes back on and i can reconnect and and, okay. and do my presentation last okay great so um ryan I, i'm not sure which, who on your team is presenting i'm going to stop my share and allow you to share your screen if you'd like All right. Okay, everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, as Brock mentioned, my name is Ryan Haig. I'm a capital projects manager for the city of Edmonds. We've been doing a lot of bike lane infrastructure work and we're really excited to show up and kind of brag about it. So without further ado, here's a little bit about our recent history. We, like many agencies, adopted a complete streets ordinance back in 2011. And this requires us as an agency to consider various forms of transportation whenever we're working on a project. So pedestrians, transit users, people with different abilities, and of course, bicyclists. Some of our more notable projects, when we overlaid a 220th street here in the heart of Edmonds a few years back in 2017 we threw bike lanes on both sides of that street created a really important east-west connector connecting the heart of Edmonds with uh, State Road 99. A couple years after that Bike to Health sponsored um, paid for by our friends over at Burdent excuse me Burdent 
this was a team project. This was interagency work with Linwood and Mount Lake Terrace. Here in Edmonds, we were gifted six lane miles of bike lanes. So this created a lot of really important connections as well. And Bertrand, when it's his turn, is, is going to he, he's going to show some maps of what all was done when. The 84th Avenue overlay is kind of an interesting one. This is an example of a project where bike lanes weren't necessarily the goal. Like we, that, that this wasn't what this project was about, but because we have this complete street or complete streets ordinance, because we're always on the lookout now for ways we can enhance our bicycle infrastructure. This is just in an instance where we identified an opportunity and, and we went for it. Um, really successful project. We have bike lanes on the northern third or so of this stretch. And then we put in sharrows from the, for the bottom two thirds of it. And uh, I wrote it just this morning, actually. It's a re really nice little stretch of road. So here are some of the typical sections that we're working with here in Edmonds. This is a pretty typical project for us. We have a lot of roads in our town that are entirely too wide for the amount of traffic that are, that's on them. And ostensibly, what you have on a lot of these roads is a pair of lanes, you know, one, one going each direction, and a whole lot of parking that no one is parking on. So we've got a whole lot of wasted pavement, just a lot of pavement sitting and doing nothing. And we are taking that pavement and shrinking down the lanes somewhat, which of course helps slow down our traffic. We're moving in some bike lanes and wherever we can, wherever we feel like it's needed, of course, we're still able to keep one parking lane, which in the overwhelming majority of instances is really doing what we need it to do. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bertrand to talk a little bit more about some of our current and upcoming projects. Sorry, that was on mute. Sorry, thanks, Ryan. Ha happens to the best of us, buddy. Yeah. So the, yeah, there are, like you mentioned, there are, we've done a lot of projects in the last couple of years and there's some upcoming projects that we're currently designing that we're looking to implement and construct next year. One of them being the 76 overlay, similar to, for, to the 84th. We're trying to also potentially incorporate, there's a, right now there's a bike lane in the southbound direction and there are sharrows on the northbound, but we're trying to do some uh, road diets and incorporate a bike lane also in the southbound, sorry, in the northbound movement as well. And on that one, we're actually uh, half the roadways in Linwood. So we're working with Linwood and having that uh, as part, included as part of the project. And that would, another benefit, it would add another three fourths of a mile of bike lanes. And then the big, the bigger one is uh, the citywide bicycle improvement. Actually, Ryan is the project manager on that one too. Um, it's a sound, we got a, almost a $2 million sound transit access grants a couple years ago. And we're looking to uh, add bike lanes on a, one of our, on a couple of our minor arterials. And that's another potentially six miles of uh, additional bike lane miles we'll be adding. And can, actually, Ryan, go to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I do want to interrupt. I do want to interrupt for just a second, B, um, because the the citywide bicycle improvements project I'm managing, but I also happen to live in the heart of the project, and in a lot of ways, I'm kind of the poster child for what we're trying to do here. Because just knowing that we were getting lanes, I ran out and bought a bike a few weeks ago, um, just just because I I know that I'm I'm going to be able to use it soon, and it's it's really exciting. Yeah, just thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to to go over this map real quick, just to, to show you guys the the connections that we've created. Uh, as you can see on the right side of the the picture, that's the interurban trail. The the one in that's the dash purple. That's the interurban trail. Um, Ten years ago, when I actually first started working in Edmonds, we created a bike lane from SO 104 to seven to two twenty eight. So that's um, Ryan. You see that one on seventy six from SO 104 to two twenty eight. Yes, yeah, the, thank you. Yeah, right there. That was that's pretty much the only bike lane we had um, until five years ago. And when we started creating these east-west corridors, bike connections, as well as north-south, uh, the one that 
Ryan was talking about 76 from 220th all the way to Olympic View Drive. That was um, that, that was done uh, about three or four years ago. That's a great north south that connects to Linwood, and then east west. Now, uh, starting next year, we'll have um, east west connection from uh, on 212th from uh, 9th all the way to um, 72nd, as well as there's already an existing one on 220th from 9th to uh, to 76. But then with the 2022 project, the citywide bicycle improvement project, we're going to create a north-south that's going to connect to shoreline because right now there's there's no bike lanes at all on that whole quarter on 100th from um, from 244th all the way to Walnut. So these that's a great uh, north-south connection that we're really looking forward to. And so, I mean, if you compare what we had up till maybe five or six years ago, we only had we're only addressing the south east portion of the of the city. Now we've definitely expanded, and um, yeah, we've out, we have a lot of more riders on our streets, and we got a lot of uh, positive comment on what we what we've completed in the last couple of years. So we're really looking forward to this uh, 22, 2022 project. And then the last, I'll go to the next one, please. This is just um, it's our Let's Go program. We're working with uh, the Edmond School District, uh, with actually Linwood and uh, Malik Terrace also involved in this Let's Go program. And it started back in 20, 2017. It's basically a program that focuses on uh, bicycle education, the third and fourth graders with, um, you got in-class uh, hands-on education. So they have a set of bikes that the Cascade Bicycle Group brings to the different schools. And then they also have some bike rodeos. Uh, obviously with the, with the COVID it has been on hold, but it, they're looking to start that again in the fall of this year. And just as a side note, uh, this is more for just for the city of Edmonds. So the bike education, it focuses on third and fourth. But what we've created in Edmonds is at the Edmonds schools is a pedestrian safety program so that the kids, when they have their, they go to the bike program, they already have a kind of a, since for bikes and pedestrians, a lot of similar uh, rules when they're on the roadway. Uh, we started a pedestrian safety program working with the school district. Um, that provides just rough uh, beginner education for uh, pedestrians for school kids that are in second grade. So then when they go to the bike program the year after, they already have the basics, a lot of the basics on how to cross the street, look left, look right, look left. That's something we touch on uh, for the second graders. And just as a positive, I mean, actually, Linwood and Malik Terrace, they're, already, they're starting to look at extending that program within their schools as well. So... Big thanks to Snowtrack for letting us come out and talk today and show off a little bit of what we've been doing. As Brock mentioned, today is Bike to Work Day, so he and I rode in this morning. This, this was uh, us grabbing coffee. So um, I'll go ahead and hand the screen back. And... Fantastic. Thank you so much. We're going to hop right into Linwood. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. Okay, Carl's leading it, it looks like. So. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about that for a quick sec. Uh, so from Linwood, we're really here to talk about what's happening now and what are we planning for? And with me today is Amy Hansen from a public works department. Uh, my name is Carl Umgren. I'm the city center program manager over at Development and Business Services. So as we look at what's happening now. I think this aerial is a great image of what I think many of us think about with Linwood, the streets and the auto dominance and really, you know, how are we creating mobility within our community? When we start to look at Linwood's transition as I'm trying to transfer slides, there we go. Um, within Linwood, we have two strategic growth centers. One is our city center, which is the area shown in blue as well as the area shown in orange is our regional growth center designation from PSRC. So within these locations, we are focusing a significant amount of opportunities for development and growth potentials so that we can better create uh, employment locations and housing options that can also better uh, facilitate mobility improvements. Within Linwood's transitions, uh, I'm sure many of us have seen the construction that's ongoing. Uh, Linwood City Center Station is, is near. It is going to open in 2024. And as we transition the next three years, we're uh, making strategic improvements to make sure that we're ready for light rail service. Now, 
what's going to be interesting with Linwood is the city center station is a temporary terminus. The, the line will stop there for probably 15 to 20 years, depending on the realignment of the ST3 projects, but then it's going to continue. And it's going to continue up to Everett um, beyond 2036. So we're seeing this transition opportunity happen where the vehicle demand at the city center station is going to eventually change and how people arrive to and from Linwood will as well. The Linwood Link extension project does include a parking garage. Uh, we do recognize that uh, parking is still a demand within our suburban context, um, but we aren't building a uh, facility to meet all parking demand. We are building a facility to enable uh, starting of trips by transit and starting trips by feet and pedal as opposed to by, by car. Uh, this transit station is going to take a significant amount of ridership. By 2035, it's expected to have nearly 18,000 boardings per day. So we're gonna see a very large number of connectivity opportunities at this location. And not many of us get to see the actual aerial of what happen what's happening there now, but we can see that the station is starting to take form. The guideway is starting to get laid out well, as well as the footings for that garage. Now, what's also interesting to think about is as this area transitions is the uh, mobility improvements that we're starting to work to negotiate with private property. And so we did a public-private partnership with what's called the Merlon Geyer Northline Village site. And this is currently where the Best Buy outlet is, JJ's Market, uh, and the Taco Time. So this location is currently owned by uh, one property owner. It's an area of 18 acres and the city executed a development agreement with them to develop this area, but also to go above and beyond our standards and put in a shared use path along 44th Avenue West that will better connect that neighborhood uh, to our library and civic campus, um, better connecting our transit system further up north also into our single family resident area. <laughs> One of the other projects that we also have worked on is another partnership that we've done with Sound Transit. And this is a multi-piece project that includes uh, the Scriber Creek Trail, which will provide a new east-west connection option. Phase one will be built with the Sound Transit improvements. And then phase two is currently under permitting for to be opened in 2023, for which we've received grants from Sound Transit's ST2 enhancement funds, as well as the ST3 enhancement funds, but also we're still doing our design on phase three. What this starts to actually provide is that year round connectivity that we're really looking forward to build as we see the need within the, um, the transit center. We wanna make sure that connecting to transit and connecting through mobility isn't just May through September, that we're able to build a network that really enhances that opportunity throughout the entire year. So these are some of the, the renderings of that project and showcasing how we're better um, meshing the street facilities adjacent to the trail facility. The last project I'd like to highlight is our Poplar Way Bridge Extension. And this bridge extension may seem a little out of character and out of place, but this is really a connectivity um, gap that we have in Linwood. And a lot of it is because of our uh, history of building infrastructure and disconnecting communities. And the Poplar Way Bridge is one to reconnect us over I-5 uh, to the Southern Linwood portion. And what this also does is not only provide congestion and safety improvements, but it actually provides that connectivity from South Snohomish County to that future light rail station uh, for the West Alderwood location. And so this one's currently been designed. We are currently looking for uh, construction funding. Um, and this is going to be a multimodal connections with, with interfacing of the inner urban trail as well as that future light rail station. So that's a lot of the, the big stuff that's happening in Linwood and the city center area right now. I'd like to turn it over to Amy Hansen to help go into the, what are we planning? Thanks, Carl. Carl. And you can go to the next slide. Um, basically, we're currently working on our Connect Linwood plan, which will be um, finalized this fall. 
people. And this is our plan to improve active transportation connections to increase our community's choices for how they travel, including to the future light rail stations. Um, I think that Carl did a really good job of showing how there's a lot of transformation happening in Linwood and we want to provide more options for our community to reach their destinations. But this is also a transition for us. Um, this plan includes both our long-term vision and our near-term action plan for improving walking and bicycling in Linwood. And this effort actually had quite a few components. We conducted school walk audits at the um, Linwood grade and middle schools with resulting countermeasures for improving um, safety for walking and biking to schools. We also had a parks access evaluation with recommendations to make it easier for people to walk and bike to our parks. We are in the process of developing a complete streets policy, which will become an or which will also include an ordinance. And we looked at our existing bike network and some of the plans that we've had, and we've made updates to that bike network as well as developing a prioritized walking and rolling network. Um, we want all of our streets to be walkable, but we are looking at different amenities are appropriate for different streets. Um, this builds on previous efforts. We had a 2008 multi-choice plan and then the Linwood Transit Center multimodal accessibility plan. Um, thanks. What you're looking at right now is Linwood's existing bike network. And you can see we have 19 miles of bikeways. And it's a mix of bike facilities, including bike lanes, sharrows, signed bike routes, and trails. So about four miles of the inner urban trail. And we want to meet the growing need and demand for riding a bicycle in Linwood. So we wanted to look at improving the network by making connections to destinations. And um, I'm going to stop for a moment. I see a question about sharrows. Those are the arrows that you see with a bicycle rider, and um, they're kind of intended to show drivers that they are sharing. This is a shared lane with vehicles and bicycles. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's see. So when we're looking at our existing network, we recognize that our bikeways meet design standards. But also riding a bike along busy streets can be uncomfortable for some drivers. So when we were looking at improvements that we could make, we took into account stress levels of bicyclists. Um, we can see that in Linwood, we have some wider streets with more and faster traffic. And not every rider is comfortable with the five foot bike lane. And it also looks like slower streets with less traffic, as you would feel intuitively. Um, also are more comfortable for more bicyclists. Um, so what we were looking at is wanting to build our current network to create more connections so that it's more complete. And as well as we wanted to look at the bicyclists in Linwood and figure out ways to make it more comfortable for all people to ride a bike um, so that they can get to their destinations. Next slide, Carl. Okay. Um, so what we have here is the 15 year bike network concept. This is basically what we came up with. We, we are aspiring to have a more complete network with um, what we're calling all ages and abilities. So more amenities that can attract more riders where they will feel more comfortable such as separated bike lanes. But as Carl was talking about all the transition we are going through, we are experiencing a lot of growth and a lot of traffic. So we are really focusing on implementing this in phases. And what you see here is the near-term implementation of the bike network, where we're really focused on um, a bike network that includes our trails and helps people access the trails, as well as the transit centers. And we are trying to prioritize connections that enhance the bike to health network. Um, I think that I am almost out of time, but I would just like to say we have like a 30 year network that is more of an aspirational. And when you look in the materials that we have in our online open house, you'll see that. But we're really interested in developing a bike network in the future that helps um, our community visit or our community access 
destinations such as parks, schools, and the transit centers, and hopefully attracting more than just the hardcore bike riders. So Carl put this slide up here, and I appreciate that, Carl. This is the link to our online open house, and it's open until June 7th. And um, thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Amy. And um, Carl or Amy, if you could drop that in the chat in case somebody wants to click on it and go there, that'd be great. Um, awesome. Let's jump to Monroe. So Scott. All right, let's see if I can drive this. Um, bear with me for a second. And uh, let's just maybe pick that one. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. You see okay. Your PowerPoint um, software. So um, if you want to do present screen, you might want to. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Well, hey, this is for the city of Monroe. And I, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what we got going. And uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background. City of Monroe is a little under 20,000. So we're not as big as, uh, you know, Linwood and Edmonds, but uh, we're kind of a rural urban kind of center. We got three major highways that come into Monroe, kind of a gateway to the Cascade recreational kind of uh, area, which as a result, we see a lot of weekend warriors heading out uh, and it kind of clogs up our main arterials there. Uh, our guiding document for uh, pretty much anything the city has in terms of improvements is our comprehensive plan. We're required by state law to update it every eight years. The last time we did this was around 2015, so it won't be too long before we revisit this document and update it once more. The left-hand side of the uh, PowerPoint here, uh, that left-hand side is uh, shows what the inventory was back in 2015. Um, it's it's not saying that the only where we have sidewalks, almost all of our streets do have sidewalks, but the emphasis here is uh, like on the blue lines where they might be off street, like shared paths that go through the neighborhoods versus just right along, you know, the back of curb or along a little planter strip. The uh, gold lines are probably more about uh, roads that actually have emphasis on uh, bike lane designation, if you will, versus just sharing the road with the uh, motorist. So that was what they found out in 2015. Since then, we've been having a lot of growth in Monroe like everybody else. Um, and residentially, we've been having a lot of growth on the north of Monroe, north of Highway 2. On the right-hand side, the uh, slide shows in our comprehensive plan what Monroe could look like over 30 years um, with additional uh, gap filling, additional off-road or off-street sidewalks and shared paths, um, utilizing some of uh, wash dots, unimproved corridors to perhaps create more of a regional bicycle trail, uh, shared path there. So you can see in general how the uh, gaps get filled, the network increases to create a more uh, uniform and easily accessible, uh, whether it be walking or bicycling in the city of Monroe. On the, on the south side of Monroe, there's the Gold Line is Main Street there. City Hall is, um, actually I could wiggle my mouth. City Hall sits right about here. And uh, I see a lot of bicyclists come by in, in groups. I assume there's bicycle clubs, whatnot, that use Main Street a lot. So I know um, this route in particular is important to the clubs. Uh, I'm not sure where they're going. They're probably just heading out into the county for some of them rural roads. Uh, ben Howard, I know, and Man Road east of us get a lot of bicycle traffic too. But I do recognize that Monroe streets are used by the bicyclists, um, either as, as a destination or at least a through path to points east and south. Um, so that's generally the background of Monroe and our comp plan and our idea of uh, bicycle and walking facilities. I was also asked then to, uh, there we go, talk about a couple of coming projects, try to best orient you guys to see where this project is. This one is uh, upcoming real soon. It's called our Chain Lake Road Phase 2A project. 
it's targeting where it had that black oval dash. It's targeting that location. Our plan is to extend about 3,100 feet or 3,200 feet uh, wide shared path along the west side, if you will, of Chain Lake Road. Um, this goes all the way up to our city limits, which is that Brown Road. And this is an area where we are, see a lot of housing development going on. So this trail, when constructed, will serve as a, a good opportunity for our new residents to maybe take the path instead of getting their car and drive. And this trail takes you all the way down to the downtown area where we have uh, big box stores, we got a theater, restaurants and whatnot. So it, it may help people there to uh, just uh, pick a different way of getting to Monroe. It was federally funded. Uh, there were 19 properties we had to negotiate partial right-of-way acquisition with. Nature of right-of-way uh, always takes longer than I expect. So we were hoping to have this project built last year, but the good news is we are now complete with our right-of-way. We've already done the bidding phase and we are about to begin construction next month. So by the end of this summer, we should have this uh, 3,200 more feet of shared path available for our public and our residents. Overall, the project I think is going to cost about 3.2 million. That's considered design and right away, and uh, then the the proposed construction cost. So, capital projects in general aren't exactly what I consider cheap. Um, it's always more expensive than you may think. But keep in mind, it's just it just kind of identifies uh, the city's interest in their, our, our effort in investing in our road system beyond just extra lanes for our you know, vehicles. We, we also are investing in you know, non-motorized ideas. The other project is right on along Highway 2. Um, this is a project where there's a gap in the sidewalk. There's uh, People who want to come, you know, from the fairgrounds or, or or somewhere in this area, once they cross the highway two, they cannot really get down to where our commercial center is without um, essentially going along the side of highway two, which is a 45 mile an hour zone in there and lots of traffic. Doesn't make them feel uh, very safe. I don't blame them. We've had some requests to figure out how to put a sidewalk in there. Uh, we applied for a federal grant. We got it through the PSRC's uh, CMAQ, CMAQ program. We got design and construction funding for it. So we have just started that project. We're about 30% complete with the design concept. I'll hop to the next slide. This shows Highway 2 on the uh, photo as in its current condition. The, uh, the concept is, is this fence line here will go away and pretty much we'd build the sidewalk on the back side of that fence. We'll put in something more aesthetically pleasing to keep uh, the sidewalk uh, users from, you know, getting into the ditch here, the roadside ditch. But uh, as you may know, can probably deduce, we have Snohomish County Fairgrounds on right next door to the north, and then we got the US 2 corridor to the south. So it's really a multi-jurisdictional buy-in or partnering with it. Monroe's leading the way. We're building the sidewalk on state property. And um, when it's done, the goal is to be able to have people get onto this sidewalk. It, it's being you know 12 feet wide, be able to get to our existing network that gets us to the commercial shopping center and have, be safely separated from highway two traffic. Additionally, this trail will serve as a, as a secondary access or, or emergency access route for the fairgrounds in case there needs to be that done. So we're building into their safety program with the Snohomish County Fairgrounds there. Uh, but in the end, we're hoping it's going to look aesthetically pleasing with uh, protection with fencing and uh, street lighting, or I uh, say pathway lighting there. Uh, <clears throat> again, we're estimating it, uh, it's currently about $1.4 million to build this uh, segment of sidewalk. It's, uh, that was a 30% estimate, a long ways to go still. It's a little rich, so I think we need to sharpen our pencils because uh, I don't think we currently have that amount of money set aside for, for ultimately build out there. But um, again, it's really in the project and things will 
get honed down a little bit as we advance the design. But I believe, I'm not sure. There we go. So we're a small city. My, I'm Scott Peterson. I'm the deputy city engineer. And then we have Kim Klinkers and Jim Gardner who are running those two projects I just talked about. This is our contact information here if you want to reach out to us about these projects or anything else we might have going with the city of Monroe. Um, but beyond that, uh, try to keep it brief and I am done with my presentation. <laughs> here i will let's see i did the classic zoom thing of, of talking uh while muted uh scott thank you so much for your presentation um it, i can personally attest to the fact that yes you do need a sidewalk and trail in that segment having been vaccinated recently and seeing that experience i i drove through it but i did see you know it's a great That'd be an important project for connecting back to downtown from the fairgrounds. So definitely needed. With that, um, Sherman, have you been able to um, figure out the electricity or the, the network issues? Actually, Sherman may have dropped off altogether, unfortunately, now that I look at the participant list. Uh oh. Oh, you're there. Perfect. Okay. Uh -oh. So, um, I mean, are you able to, to present or do you want to just jump in with Q&A? Do you want to say something about the planning work you're doing and then we can jump into Q&A? Actually, I, I think I can try this here, but I'm trying to get to, now I got to get to the back to sh share yeah. this. So, yeah, I think let's, let's try that if we can. Perfect. How do I get to that? Um, where there we go share screen let's see okay can you see that yeah we can see it um if you go to present mode that'd probably be best okay um where is that at here this do over from your cursor uh from current slide or from beginning yeah oh, there we go okay here we go okay so yeah this <laughs> it's amazing the power just came on like literally three minutes ago here but um yeah the thanks for the opportunity to share with you guys um this is uh we're still draft form and we're still you know trying to prepare and put this together at this stage of the game and that's kind of where all our money is going right now as far as bike bike facilities go it's um you know, we don't have any specific projects, although there's road projects that are really we're working on that are incorporating bike facilities. Um, but uh, mainly the purpose of our bike plan was to, you know, we're going to go over that first is just to, you know, include concepts and facility types in our current plan that that um, right now is just based on our like a uh, you know, like you guys see it, uh, some of the presenters said before there, you know, was back in our comprehensive plan days and we just had a map with a single page of a lot of lines on streets saying these are going to be our, where our bike network is, but without any real costs or anything like that associated with it, just, um, you know, and they're just bike lanes. Bike lanes was, that was the only type of facility, you know, that we're going to implement. Things have changed now, and so we're uh, updating to look at making safer, safer connections, and to develop a actual plan that prioritizes and you know has an implementation strategy to it, um, as well as a budget and everything. <clears throat> so some of the considerations that we had when we started to redevelop this bike plan is that the um, the network is based on uh, kind of like a, a street hierarchy system, where we have two major uh, we have two major trails uh, running north south, which is the North Creek Trail, and a regional trail, and other, and then we have the Sammamish River Trail, which runs east west, more towards the uh, southern part of the city. But that is kind of like our freeway system, and right now it's 
for the most part, like 90% complete on both of those. So our concept in developing this plan was to get everybody to try to get to the bike freeways and to develop the bike net arterial network, which is the next level down would be arterial types of uh, maybe protected protected bike lanes that were safer, um, that you know carry a main main connection to get to those trails, and then you know as you downgrade to, to collectors where lower lower level streets, and maybe those are going to be buffered bike lanes or bike lanes themselves, and uh, and then so forth, and until we get to even neighborhoods where we may do shares and call them out as the neighborhood greenways. So that's kind of how we started relooking at the plan. The other, the other uh, concept as you look on the right side here is to look at this level of stress um, by facility and level of traffic stress is just a measure and a criteria that we use to, uh, to kind of identify which corridors were, you know, were most, you know, were the most un uncomfortable for riders and that what, what type of a facility that would be utilized to uh, best address that type of thing, whether it's a shared use path, which is complete, completely separated or a separated bike lane, which, you know, we'll have as a, which we're pro uh, projecting as <clears throat> a sidewalk grade um, bike lane with the, um, with the, uh, landscape strip separating as a buffer between the travel way and the bike lanes. And this, this minimized, this minimized the use of right of way needs because you're just switching the bike lane from the street into the sidewalk level. <clears throat> so that's kind of one of the things that we're looking at. Um, additionally, you know, we're just, again, just trying to improve safety, you know, enhance connections, provide some equity and then try to find a way to, you know, increase the ridership. <clears throat> what we've done today then is um, we've, you know, documented our existing bike network, had a couple of uh, public outreach open houses and gotten feedback from people. And, and basically that kind of, that input back was basically had to do with a lot of existing, existing maintenance issues on bike facilities that people had issues with. Some people provided feedback on, yeah, new connections, new, you know, which obviously we, we need. Um, and, and, you know, mostly just what they, we felt was most important to them. And, you know, do you want high quality, comfortable routes, which are super expensive. And we all know, although I'm sure Edmonds, Monroe, we all, Linwood, you know, having, those budget issues and what do you spend your money on? Do you want an ex expanded network or do you want high quality corridors, you know, that are comfortable and safe, which are gonna be way more expensive and eat up your budget? You know, I don't know what everybody else's uh, experience is right now and we're gonna find out soon enough, but, you know, we're not projecting a lot of money, you know, in terms of grants or anything for just bikes. Um, you know, I think, just as a, a starting a starting level, we're looking at maybe you know a half a million budget a year on putting into bike facilities and things like that. Maybe everybody, maybe some people get has bigger budgets, but they're not going to be just for bikes. They're going to be for the roads, you know, and where we can incorporate road projects and get that kind of funds. Yeah, we'll definitely incorporate the bike plans. So, having said that. We, we, what we did in our in our approach now is going is that we're developing basically two plans. One I call the citywide bike plan, and the second one is the design standards plan. And essentially, the the citywide bike plan is based on our assessment of looking at existing pavement widths for all the bike corridors that we want in the city. Um, looking at where minimal gaps need to be connect make, to make connections are, uh, where we have Apple right of way and something that we can fit in that we could put like a bike lane or just something to connect, make connections for bikes. Not ideal and does not necessarily address the level of traffic stress criteria that we had uh, in, you know, utilized 
but it is something that will expand the network and we can something that we could start incorporating with you know a a modern you know nominal nominal budget from that we could probably get approved from council and everybody else the second one is the design standards plan <clears throat> which does look at you know our high quality facilities something that we will look at for a long term um, initiation in terms of when we have opportunities associated with road road improvements or where we have developer driven uh, projects that will improve frontages and whatnot and those that plan is uh what we call a design standards plan that we have and we'll code codify and use in our uh, development review <clears throat> and that's what we we'll incorporate for that and and then we have our citywide bike plan which we can kind of like our sidewalks plan which is you know we have a, we have a minimal budget and get whatever grants we can and we just start building that out that's kind of where we are we're trying to finalize the cost estimate process right now where you know even the citywide bike plan itself costs it out to maybe like 30 million dollars which would take 10 20 years 20 years to you know if we're lucky to get that kind of funding and the design standards plan would just be out there because that is the network that works the best that addresses the level of traffic stress. <coughs> so again, implementation, you know, for the bike plan is is just based on funding and grant opportunities over time. It's not an overnight process. You know, we have to manage expectations for our residents and everybody that, you know, we're looking at projects that are cost effective and provide safety benefits. But we're also with the adoption of the design standards, looking at the long term future development to build out the network to, you know, and mainly to get again to the freeway. So as we establish that annual budget in our in our capital facilities plan, that's kind of our that's kind of our pro thinking process right now. And we're gonna, you know, run that through with uh, the public run that through our planning commission and hopefully get adoption uh, of the regional, you know, with regional network coordination. And we're going to have those stakeholder stakeholder uh, uh, outreach in our in our next round of public outreach, which should probably be, uh, you know, next month, early next month and or so mid mid next month and and uh, probably a few We've got you guys now that I know who you are and the players next door to us. <laughs> We'll probably get that invitation to to come and comment on it. Um, yeah, our future steps is right now is just to develop those costs, finalize those cost estimates. Um, you know, look at the look at completing our final draft by the end, you know, middle of June or so, and and holding out our public outreach and and then going to our planning commission and council review by before the end of the year, and ideally to get this all adopted and even amended to our comprehensive plan by the end of the year so that by next year we can start looking at uh, uh, applying for grants um, because it is in our comprehensive plan which is kind of usually a a consideration that for for all grant <laughs> for all grant applicants and that's what i have fantastic thank you so much sherman um, kind of a different twist than everybody else's yeah. little more of the process than the projects <laughs> and i appreciate each city is taking a a little bit different approach and i'm i'm interested to hear what questions folks might have here on this call um i want to highlight um two other cities real quickly that things that are happening um the the city of marysville recently completed a trail project that connects to the centennial trail so that is fantastic just open i believe this past week um, and the city of um, snohomish uh, not exactly a bike project but uh, this week was considering a phased approach towards implementing 20 miles per hour speed limits on uh, almost all streets uh, through the city of snohomish so lots of great work happening here within our communities. Um, and certainly from a snow tracks perspective, you know, we're all about thinking about the folks who are not thought about that much. Um, and so one of the design principles I heard from the city of Linwood, especially, and from the 
Um, the city of Bothell is thinking about all ages and abilities and building networks for all people. Um, and, uh, you know, from young people who are eight years old to old people who are 80 years old and thinking about that design parameters. And certainly from Snowtrack's perspective, that's what we want to focus on. Um, so with that, uh, I would love, I think we have a time for maybe one or two questions, not that many, we went a little over. Um, so see if folks have questions. And feel free to just, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask if you have one. I have a question for Mr. Sherman. I have a question for the Linwood folks. Um, in terms of, you know, I saw how you guys have kind of a phased approach, which is I, I think ideal kind of the same thing we're thinking in, in, in just in a different, different methods. Like what is, what types of facilities are the first phase projects? Are they incorporating like, you know, pretty, pretty high quality expensive project, you know, protected bike lane type things where, you know, you need to rebuild curbs and everything, or are they more like just adding bike lanes and such like that, like we, like we have for our, what we're calling our citywide bike plan network? Uh, that's a good question. And that's something that we've been wrestling with as we're trying to improve the amenities as well as improve connections. Um, we are, we are doing both, but we recognize that the more comfortable facilities, things like shared use paths, as well as um, buffered bike lanes, you know, they are more expensive. And the buffered bike lanes also take up more space in our right of way. And it gets to be really expensive when you're talking about moving the curb. And because of all of the changes that Carl was highlighting, it's also, you know, it, I think it, I think it feels stressful to our community to think about changing the um, capacity for cars on the streets as well. So we're, we're going for a mix and we're trying to hit the low hanging fruit. So we're focusing on, you know, making where we can, like, you know, we are going to be having connections that are the five foot bike lanes and the less comfortable amenities, but we're also um, trying to move forward where we can with more comfortable facilities. So that's why we're focusing on connections to the Scriber Lake Trail and Interurban Trail. And I believe there were a couple of connections up north that will also have something more comfortable. Um, Carl, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just important to highlight that with the amount of private development we also have coming in, that we're going to be able to utilize that as an asset to help us redevelop some of our streets as well. So by us highlighting exactly where these locations are, we can extract that through development because uh, it's much easier for them to do some frontage improvements than for us through the capital project, and it's typically cheaper too. So. Now, one thing I would point out is if we had that map up, like the Scriber Lake Trail, we don't have an exact alignment selected or anything like that. It's very preliminary. But one thing on that map is we're trying to show an extension way up north and crossing 99. And that's because we're trying to have a target to plan for. And figuring out a way to cross 99 is going to be a big deal, but something that we do want to make accessible for multiple um, modes. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate your, appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, approach. We're just, again, we're trying to get through this, uh, you know, to make it, to make it amenable for everybody, really. I think, you know, like our general public, you know, some of, half of them, you know, said they want networks like that. You know, let's just get bike lanes in, let's get expanded network where others, the other half, 50%, I, you know, really literally 50, 50% said, we want high quality, something safe for all our, for our kids to ride on and everything. And honestly, you know, I wouldn't let a 12 year old ride on the Buffalo way, <laughs> a bike lane. It's just, you know, that was the old way. And, but it's not, it's frankly not safe, you know? So I, I you know, we're trying to look at something where, uh, 
we can provide at least something buffered as a minimum and for something safer, you know. Yeah, and we're we're providing targets to plan for and work towards. Like we know that it's going to take a while and resources, but that's what we can do. I guess I have one question as a kind of maybe out of the box question for funding, and I love to. Uh, I have a maybe a follow up for Jennifer with that, which is, um, and this will be the last two questions because we need to move on to the next thing. So I'm sorry, folks, if you had a question, I'm soaking up your time and we can provide contact information to connect uh, for that. But Sherman, you outlined like maybe your projects would cost $30 million to go build all at once. And certainly as you think about as a mid-sized uh, city trying to accommodate that is difficult from a bike project. $30 million isn't actually all that much money for transportation projects in the region, right? No. And so I'm wondering for all of your communities, if you think there's an opportunity to rethink how we fund projects um, through state transportation packages or regionally, such that you could package all those 30, like at least half of them um, of those projects into one project that you seek funding for from the state. And so that way is a line item is, is a lot different when you go fund those projects. Um, so that, that's like half the question. The other half for, for question is for Jennifer, which is um, you're funding some great projects. What's driving you to fund those projects? So. Are you, who's that answering? Uh, there are two separate questions. I'll let the, the first question be answered by the, the cities here. Um, I understand. I'll just say for that for 30 million, that that number is what we just did a cost estimate for doing all of the, you know, the it, the citywide bike plan projects, not the design standard plan, not the grandiose plan. That's going to be over 100 million, you know. Yeah. So um, our plan for the 30, if we got 30 million and we got it in all in one grant, which I don't know even know of a grant that it has that, but if we did, you know, yeah, we would incorporate, we may, we may incorporate differently and not just do the whole citywide network. I would say we would probably pick and choose to do a couple of actually nicer projects and, you know, back and forth because one can continue on while, you know, you're building, you're, you continually build the low hanging fruit ones, you know, yearly and, and using some of that, the money for some, some big money like that to do nicer projects. And uh, I don't know. It's the second question was I'm not sure what the second question the was. The question was most was more for Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's a good it's a good question. We have so for those not familiar with the Burden Health Commission, um, we're actually the program of the public hospital district in South County. So we're a public entity um, that has pivoted. We're no longer running the hospital. Uh, we're making grants and have been making grants for ten years in this kind of health and wellness space in our geography, which is South South County that uh, we define, um, is Edmonds, Linwood, Mountley Terrace, Briar, Woodway, and portions of unincorporated and a little corner of Bothell also. Um, and so our, our board of elected commissioners has identified priority areas and um, access and um, safety and uh, childhood obesity were some pretty early priorities that came out of our came out of our work. And so the uh, Bike to Health grant um, that both Edmonds and Linwood referenced was something that we funded, uh, approved back in 2014, right? It took it took several years to, to work its way through the process. And then the, some of the education work with Cascade Bicycle Club as well is something that um, we've been supporting for a while. Our work varies uh, greatly and the infrastructure pieces um, we open up to special kind of RFPs and have done that twice in our in our 10 years. And I am actually expecting that we will likely do one in the next year or so as well. Um, so we have kind of a rolling grant cycle um, quarterly process for applications for programming. Uh, but the infrastructure piece is, is much larger and we've just uh, funded, um, had two funding cycles for that in the past. So Bike to Health was uh, came out of one of those. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I, I think it also helps everybody who, who's unaware about your work to understand a little bit more about it. I want to thank all of the panelists for taking your time today. We obviously we only you know thin deep uh, skin deep of how much we were able to get into your work, but 
you're doing, all of you are doing good work, uh, a little bit different approaches, different timings as to where you're at in different communities, but thank you. Um, and we, you know, I look forward to continuing working with your communities as, as you move forward in your projects. So with that, we're gonna hop into the next agenda item.